Simone Tippett or Simone Alice Tippett. I was born in Keith in the mid southeast of South Australia. Um, up until year seven at Keith and then secondary school at between Kingston and Millicent at a school called Kangaroo Inn Area School. Dad's a farmer mm -hmm. and mum was a housewife and a mum. Uh, the farm at Keith had crops and stock, so sheep and cattle. Um, I think they even had goats at one stage. So when we grew up, I remember Dad was artificially inseminating goats, which was an unusual thing for the time. And then when we moved to a different farm between Kingston and Millicent, that was mainly, you know, lambs for fattening. And I think there might have been some steers as well for fattening. It was great. Um, my primary school was at Keith Area School, which was a lovely little school. My secondary school was at Kangaroo Inn Area School, which was a tiny school that had, it was in the middle of nowhere. There was a couple of houses that some of the teachers stayed in, but there were no shops. And it was from reception to year 12, and there was about 200 kids. And the year that I did matric was with corris by correspondence, and we had the most number of matric students that they've ever had, which was six. I think most kids who grew up in the country then have probably got stories to tell that probably sound a bit outrageous now compared to the way kids grew up in the city. But we had a fabulous childhood. We used to get locked out, you know, well not locked out, but you know, sent out in the morning and told not to come home till dinner time. So my brother and I, who my brother's young, a couple of years younger, we would just do what all kids do, you know, build wingwoms, make bows and arrows, shoot each other, um, find pet lizards, have to put them back because we kept playing with them and we were told we weren't allowed to. Um, and you know, we had a pet kangaroo, we had a, <laughs> I hope it's right to say this, we had a pet lamb called Jesus and that was because mum was cooking for jackaroos and the lamb, I used to, apparently used to bring the lamb into the kitchen and she'd go, Jesus Christ, get that thing out of here because it used to pee in the corner while she was cooking dinner. And everyone except her thought that was very funny. So that the lamb got called Jesus. So there's a whole series of slides of me as a very little girl um, feeding this lamb. And at the, written at the bottom in my mum's handwriting is Simone and Jesus. Unless you're going to be a farmer or marry a farmer and have babies or work at the local chemist, um, there really wasn't anything to stay in the country for. So, um, so I just, I, I, it never occurred to me that I could go to university. Um, I probably didn't have the confidence and mum and dad didn't have a lot of money. So it probably never occurred to them that university education was free at that point. So I just got a job and, you know, started working. Uh, I was a research assistant, which is a very fancy way of saying, you know, basically the bottom of the pecking order in a company that worked on Valletta Road in Finden Park that was a research in, in, the print, in the commercial print industry. So they re researched techniques and toners, liquid toners. Um, and my job was to sit in the dark and operate the machine, preferably without breaking it. They were extraordinary machines. I mean, the machine um, that I used to use, I can't remember what it was called, but it had four trays at the back that were about a metre wide and about three inches deep and about half a metre deep into the machine. And they held liquid toner, CMYK, and you had to use uh, transparencies for each colour. It was the same thing over and over again. Just And what they were testing was the way that different, the chemical composition of the different colours work together to get colours that they could then sell. So it was pretty, it sounds exciting, but it was very, very mundane work. Really wanted to grow up and be a marine biologist like David Attenborough and just swan around the world and looking at interesting things. And, um, and it sort of completely passed me by the fact that you actually needed to do chemistry and biology and things like that. So I enrolled and I got really good marks when I did matric. Um, so I probably would have been one of the kids most likely to go to university when I, when I was at school. Um, and was, the, was probably one of the few who didn't. And so I started as a mature age student in my, I don't know, I might have been 24 or something like that. And I'd never done any biology and I was very shy and I didn't know any people. So I didn't actually realise that you needed to get a good support group around you. So I just failed pretty much everything. 
I think I got one 95% for one essay and everything else I failed. I wanted to go overseas to go to Nepal and go trekking and the only time I could go trekking was in the middle of the year which meant I was going to fail yet another subject which was pretty dire because I'd failed quite a few of the others. Um, and I was at this point still quite determined to, to be a marine biologist. Um, so I took the money that I'd saved up to go to Nepal and I enrolled myself in a short in some in a short course of life drawing at Stanley Street. And I can still remember, you know, feeling like the world had just gone all topsy turvy when I was sitting in there and went, Oh, this is what it's all about, you mm. know. Just you know that feeling of when you feel like you've come home to something and you don't know why. Well, I didn't I didn't know any of the students. I went with a friend, we both did the course together and then we both did a clay modelling course. I can't I think we might have done nude clay modelling because I was working in a swimming we were all working at swimming pools. So we used to see people in their bathers all the time, which meant if you if you're used to looking at people with essentially no clothes on and then and you're you're sporty, which I was, um, and then you start doing life drawing and clay modelling, like you just know where everything goes, you know, without even thinking what to look for. It was really it was really quite interesting how easy it came because of just standing on the edge of the pool watching people swim. Um, so we did that, but it was at night, so there were no other art students there. So we were sort of walking through these, this amazing building and you could kind of feel the students but not see them. Yeah. And it just seemed very exotic to me. And they all seemed very worldly and very cool and um, like they came from a different world. It was very attractive. I did lots of drawing did some sculpture which I was pretty crap at, um, but I tried really hard. Uh, did lots of history because I loved that. Um, and then I think I did, the printmaking was an elective, so I, there were two years worth of printmaking that could be done and that was with Diane Longley, who's a local artist who's very well respected for printmaking. Um, and it was was interesting because the the printmakers always felt that, that printmaking was something that the school had but didn't really, you know, they didn't really encourage hugely, which we always thought was a bit weird in a school that actually pr was very proud of its teaching of the basic skills of drawing and things like that, that it wouldn't actually foster printmaking to a greater degree. Um, and having said that, I, I, I understand that, um, that they're not taking, the, Adelaide Central's now moving to the new facilities in Glenside and I understand that they're not taking the printmaking there, so I don't know, don't know what's going on, but um, yeah, it was just a bit strange. So, And then I found that a lot of the students who are really interesting, re interested in printmaking, who are all mature age women, um, that was the other great thing about Adley Central. There were so many people who were 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, and they were all professional people, and they all travelled, and they brought so much to the classes. It was, it was, they were very interesting classes for that reason. Um, so anyway, a lot, of the print, a lot of the people who were interested in printmaking started going to TAFE and then Diane went to TAFE as well. So yeah, eventually I did too. When did you start at the TAFE? Uh, I think two years ago. I did a lithography, I tried out a subject cross-institutional, did lithography, which was great. And then just fell in love with TAFE because the I don't know what the other departments are like, but the printmaking department in TAFE feels a lot like Adelaide Central did in the early days. Just this, a lot of energy, a lot of sharing. Um, the lecturers sit down with the students, they quite often will socialise, um, and everybody just wants to talk about what they're doing. You know, they don't want to, they're not precious about information and techniques, they all want to share, and if they find something exciting, they'll just want to tell everybody about mm -hmm. it, which is really lovely, very lovely. I think I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none sort of person. Um, I just like, I really like learning new things. So from the moment I've left school, I've been doing courses the whole way through um, in whatever could be anything. Uh, so I do think I just like to learn new techniques. Um, so last year, I haven't actually finished my degree yet, but I get really good marks these days. I'm not failing anything. <laughs> um, uh, I think last year, or well, this year, earlier this year, I did book arts, so making different kinds of books, which was marvellous. We did a collaboration with the writers at TAFE, so the writers wrote poetry and the printmakers um, 
made prints and then we made a box set and everyone got one. I mean, and that's quite indicative of what the printmaking department's like because they tend to be real high achievers and this was on top of their usual workload. Everyone's in third year and about to graduate and nobody was getting marked for this, you know, it, and they all did it for the love of it. You know, so that, that's the kind of great feeling that's in that department. Uh, and also I started restoring a letterpress. So we had a research subject, so for that I started restoring a letterpress. I've got some friends who are really fabulous called Renata Nissi and David Futrell who have, they live in Stepney and Renata's a, a sculptor and, and she does lots of other things as well. But she runs an art class and she calls it Union Street Studios because they live in Union Street. And she run, she's been running that for many, many years. And the, the, when the classroom wasn't being used for classes, a few of us would use it as a studio. So my press, I've got an intaglio press, um, that's been there for probably seven or eight years. And a couple of years ago, she and David will travel a lot. Uh, and they asked whether I wanted to run a class for them, for her class, when she was away. So I put together a little printmaking class. We did mono printing and dry point. And from there, I've started teaching a small class every Saturday um, with the press. So because printmaking is a fairly specific kind of activity, it only attracts certain kinds of people, whereas painting and drawing attract a much, seem to attract a much broader range of people and sculpture. Um, it's a very small class, um, but you can guarantee that everyone's going to want to do something different. So I've tried to accumulate enough gear and enough knowledge to be able to offer whatever people want. So sometimes there might be three people, one will be doing a lino print, one will be doing a dry point, and one will be doing a screen print, and I have to and I don't necessarily know that until I arrive on the morning who's going to turn up and what they're going to want to do because it's people's relaxing time and you know they tend to be more haphazard with their approach to it than what they would with their own work so I just have to be able to fly by the seat of my pants and make it up on the spot and make it a good experience for them so yeah so anything screen printing stenciling if you've got a press that's 400 years old you can still use it if you've looked after it but most people won't be able to have one and they the amount of gear that goes with them is huge and heavy and takes up a lot of space which means you get groups of people coming together around a press and a, a, a studio with a press in it so you need to store the paper somewhere you need to dry the print somewhere and all of that stuff is um, takes up a lot of room um, so, and printmakers seem to be quite hard workers, so they'll come together around a press and work really hard, but then they've got to share the press with other people, so someone else might want to use it at the same time or directly afterwards, which means you've got to clean up after yourself, which means you tend to be a little bit more considerate, my theory is, a bit more considerate of others, so you, you know, particularly the older students will usually leave the facilities in a better state than they found it. And that kind of thing where people share and help each other, you know, some prints actually you need a couple of people to, to actually put the bit of paper on because the paper might be so big that one person can't do it on their own. So you, I think there's a tendency for people to want to work together and get on, even though they might be quite individual about their own project. Um, and they'll come together over lunch and chat about what they've done and what went wrong and what was what accident they just you know what what accident happened and what they've discovered from that I took to just photographing textures which is what a lot of people do when they hit the desert um, and so that's one of the things that I'm very interested in is how um, the macro micro thing of and, and fractals the way that you can take a close-up photo of a bit of baked dirt that no one would ever notice because it's just a bit of cracked dirt. But it actually looks very similar to like a, a picture from outer space. And you know, I know this has been done to death um, in recent years, but, and also that those things can actually give you a feel for something without actually describing it literally. And I think they're more, that's more powerful. So there's that, and there's water, because I've spent years working at swimming pools watching I spent two, 
two years, every cent I earned when I was working at Ben's Burnside Pool, I bought Polaroid film, and every time I had a break, I went and took Polaroid photos of the bottom of the pool. For two years, I've got thousands and thousands of proper Polaroids of the bottom of, this, of Ben's Burnside Swimming Pool. And all the people who were coming, I used to lie them out on the, on the desk, because I was on the desk, and all the doctors and lawyers that would come in for their Sunday morning swim would want to know what I doing, was doing with them. And every time I just have to say, I don't really know. Just, I just like taking them. <laughs> and they, that really, they really struggled with that. Like the fact that you would do that without actually knowing what it's for. And eventually it became an artwork and it was fabulous. But, you know, for two years I didn't know what was going on. Um, so, sort of outbacky stuff and water. And also I really, really like blue a lot. Um, which is a bit of a standing joke amongst anyone who knows me because uh, that's all I wear. <laughs> Occasionally I try and buy something as a different colour and I don't wear it. So I really like blue. So I think um, being fascinated with water and, you know, I used to surf and all that sort of stuff has probably got a lot to do with that. You know, blue skies, blue water, all that sort of thing. Um, so as a subject, I find water quite interesting because it's quite hard to draw. But also, it's, um, I mean, people have to come together around water, otherwise they die. Um, I don't know, that sounds a bit facile, but it, it's just one of those things that can be very beautiful. It's really necessary, but can also be quite scary. Like if you've ever gone surfing and almost drowned, you know, it has a quite a terrifying aspect to it as well. Um, but Quite aside from that, I think it's really pretty. Um, and when I met Olawali, who is the person that Olawali and I have been paired up for the traditional cast, crafts, blah, blah, crafts project, sorry, um, is, is Olawali is Nigerian and his, his craft is indigo dyeing, which is the most fabulous shade of blue. He's got some really lovely ideas about the importance of art in a community and how it brings people together and how people share and heal that are really, really beautiful and to me feel like they really, um, they synchronise with some of the things that I think about printmaking and also about water, although I don't know that I've actually ever really said that overtly to Olawali, he may not agree with that, but I, th I, I can see the parallels in how people come together and they feel better from doing something together in an environment that is healing for them, which is what I think um, a printmaking studio can be, but also water can be. The things that I've learnt from Olawali and his belief about how people live and how people help each other and how they work together over art, they make sense to me from those backgrounds. I don't know if that's what it means to him, but it certainly makes sense to me. He's very free though, and I'm very tight, which I find that really inspiring to see how free he is. And he really, he's really great with using his gut, mm. whereas I operate more from my head, which I'm not sure is a great thing. I think a bit of both is probably good. We spent the first couple of months just teaching us each other things, actually quite a bit of time. We came up with a very careful um, uh, timeline, which has since fallen by the wayside. Um, but we spent many months in the beginning taking in turns to teach each other things. He taught me how to batik um, paper. Obviously he's taught, taught me how to um, do the indigo stuff. So we've done quite a bit of indigo dyeing. We did some at Renata's as well and we, <laughs> we established at that point, and I think he's done some at another friend's house. We've, dis we've discovered that it's actually much better to have a textile studio. <laughs> It's actually a very difficult thing to do in the backyard, um, particularly when it's not your own backyard. <laughs> You've got to be very careful. So it was, all, it was all good and it all worked, but I think it'd actually be easy to use a textile studio. Um, so we did that. Um, I've, uh, so I've taught him, you know, uh, lino printing, and I think we did some mono printing, but not much. We did lots of dry point. Um, I think we did some stenciling at one stage, but not very much. Um, oh, he's taught me applique, so reverse applique, which was fabulous. 
Um, in fact, I've got my little book here. If you excuse me shuffling, I'll go through it and I'll tell you. Uh, I've taught him some basic bookbinding stuff. So how to fold paper, how to fold prints and turn them into little artist books. Um, just really simple things that can be really effective. Oh, one thing we did which was fabulous was he, an, another friend of mine from the printmaking class wanted to put some colour into her prints and that and into her lino prints. Which, so she'd done black lino, black ink on um, rice paper and we're trying to work out different ways to get colouring because they were very stark and graphic and black and white. We wanted a bit more subtlety. And that, that had happened just after Olawali had showed us the batiking rice paper with inks. And so there was all this wax lying around the place and he'd been using food dyes and the food dyes weren't waterproof. So they, they had some great effects, but it, it wasn't necessarily as stable as what um, he wanted because he was used to different dyes in Nigeria that we couldn't find in Adelaide. Um, and I've got a friend who is a tempera painter. So I knew that one way you could do tempera painting was to get, uh, not crayons, but actual um, pastels, like dry pastels, crumble them up, mix them with a bit of egg yolk, and then that, that becomes the basis for your tempera paints. So what we started doing was just sort of slapping on a bit of this wildly coloured, grated up um, old pastel, cheap, nasty pastel, and putting them on the back of lino prints and then waxing over the front of the lino print. And so the waxing would make the paper go th like see-through and translucent like an onion skin, um, which means that all the colour on the back would show through. The last time we spoke, my understanding, and take it with a grain of salt because I wasn't in his head, so I don't know exactly what he meant, um, was that he was very interested in what happens between people and bringing people together because, you know, he's Nigerian. He comes from a place that's got, I think, something like 90 million people. And I can't remember how many different language groups, but a crazy number of language groups and a whole lot of differences around religion and culture and, and also north and south. And there's a lot of strife around those things. So one of the things that crops up a lot that I've noticed that you, you might have noticed as well is that when he does an indigo pattern, it's often about the different parts of the pattern making the whole. And that seems to be about the way he thinks that different people are necessary to make a whole healthy society and that they need each other and they need to work together and be tolerant and understanding of each other. It's a marvellous project, the, the traditional projects. The fact that it's had so many aspects to its, um, its presence, you know, the fact that, you know, there's been tradi traditional craftsmen teaching local people who may have never met an immigrant or a refugee from Africa or, you know, Iran or wherever they've come from. Um, something, you know, they're people who are really interested in textiles and this, that and the other, but they have, may have only met other white people, you know, and to actually bring them into contact with someone who's really passionate about a craft is, is a really amazing thing.